And I'm here with Raj Chast. She is, of course, a uh, cartoonist. Her, her work has been appearing in The New Yorker since 1978. And she's the author of Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? Can't we? Can we? <laughs> this is about watching parents grow older this and die. True. This is true. Yeah. And of course, that's not going to happen to us. So, no. Uh, no. So <laughs> but it did happen to you. Yeah. This is about you watching your parents. Yes. When did you decide that this was a story you had to tell? I think it was something that didn't come all at once. I, I think I have a habit of, in my head, taking notes on whatever. Uh, you know, whether they're verbal or pictorial or just, you know, making a note of things as they're happening. happening. And at some point, um, I think it started to dawn on me that there was actually a story here that I wanted to put on paper. Is this, is this is that the way you work normally? You're taking notes? Like what kind of notes? What would they, what, what would they look like? What would they say? Um, or would they be drawings? A lot of, well, they'd be drawings and notes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, the material for this book, a lot of it, um, some of it was cartoons that I had submitted as just part of my regular mm -hmm. weekly submission. Mm -hmm. Like the, um, the oven mitt story mm -hmm. was something that I had visited my parents and um, I picked up an oven mitt in my parents' apartment and I said, you know, why do you have this? It's disgusting. It's, it's, you know, it's grody, it's filthy, it's burnt, it has patches on it. Why are you patching an oven mitt, mom? And then I looked at the patches and I realized that the material from the patches came from a skirt that I had sewn in like seventh grade home economics class. And I realized she probably had that skirt someplace as well. It was very typical of my parents because they were. Well, like, I know. I was going to say because we come to realize that that is very typical. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right? exactly. They're hoarders. Yes. They keep yeah, everything. They, are, they keep everything. They cannot throw anything away. But I think this was a habit that came from their having grown up poor. Both of them, um, they were children of Russian immigrants, and also they graduated from college into the Depression. And I think those sort of scrimpy habits, mm -hmm. you know, continued all throughout their lives. And, and they were um, they were a unit, very much a unit. Oh yeah. But a unit in some ways, at least in your telling, apart from the culture. I mean, looking in still throughout their lives at the the rest of the culture. I think they fit into a certain segment of the culture that was on the outside of American culture of the 50s and 60s, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did not listen to any pop music. They did not listen. Frank Sinatra to them, I mean, I'm not a big Sinatra fan, but to them, Frank Sinatra sounded, it was like garbage. And they did not distinguish between, like, the Beatles mm -hmm. would sound like, probably would sound like Frank Sinatra to them. The whole thing, any pop music sounded exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and your work is often very um, personal, yeah. but was this, did this take you into some deeper realm? Yeah, this was, a, this was probably the most personal thi thing I've ever done. I think with my cartoons, um, the, the parent-like fi figures are kind of uh, my own archetypes of parents, and they are, you know, taken a little bit from my parents and other people's parents and parents I've read about and parents I dreamed about and parents that I made up, and it's like a mishmash. They're not specifically, except in the case of things like the oven mitt story, which right. was actually true. Um, but in this case, the people I was writing about was actually, were actually them. And that meant what for you? Um, uh, well, I, well, let's put it this way. I could not have written it until after they died. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because part of it, and, and again, is going back to what your, 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 your joke at the beginning, that this can't happen to any of us. Right. This, of course, <laughs> happens to all of us. Yes, right? of course, of and this course. Is, and, and, and so many people connect with watching a parent, um, in some cases, live on too long, yes. if that's okay to say. You but know. it's not just but that it happened to your parents. It yeah. also is going to happen to us. Yes, yeah. You know? Oh, really? That's, yeah, oh, that, no, I, yeah, I, I know, yeah. I know. I forget that most of the time. I'm sorry, <laughs> you know what, I'm just wrong. <laughs> I just made that up. <laughs> but, but did you have, I mean, you must have people coming up to you all the time and saying, oh, that you told my story. Yeah, much yeah. more so than I expected. Yeah. I, I've gotten 
many, many letters from people who said, you know, do you live in my house? Yeah. You know, this is exactly my story. Yeah, yeah. And I thought I was the only one who went through this. Speaking of living in your house, I can actually say, so we've known each other a long time, I lived in your house. It's true. Yeah, it's I true. moved into your apartment in Brooklyn. When, and I only bring that up because it's part of the story here. You moved to Connecticut. Yes. And, and that meant moving away from Brooklyn where your parents were. Yeah. And that's one of the hinge points of this story, right? Yeah. 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 It's, uh, they were still living in the apartment where I grew up. Uh, we had moved in there in 1959, and uh, they never budged. It was really an accumulation of 50 years of stuff, and they never threw anything away, ever. Yeah. I mean, newspapers, magazines, you know, old handbags, you know, that were patched with masking tape, um, rolls of masking tape that were completely dried out, you know, just nothing. Not, you yeah. know, they never threw anything out. Yeah. Which meant that eventually you had to uh, deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's really sad. Yeah. It's kind of horrible. But it's, you know, I mean, everything about this is sad and yet funny. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, I mean, I mean and you're exploring both sides of it in, in your cartoons there are and some in this very book. funny things about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Are you aware of the humor, of the funny part of it as you're doing it, or do you find the humor later? Uh, it really depends. I mean, sometimes, w you know, I think with a lot of things, it, it, at the time, everything is extremely upsetting, and then you look back on it, and it actually can be sort of funny. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other part of it in that move is at, when they get older, yeah. then you had to move uh, your mother up closer, right? I think it was well, uh, well, both, both, of, both of them up, of them yeah, actually. eventually to an assisted living yeah. situation. And they were, I think, 94 yeah. when I moved them right. um, out of their apartment. And, uh, you know, there were a couple of health crises that happened, mostly my mother's physical health and uh, my father's mental health, and they really could not live on their own anymore. Right. And we tried it. They probably stretched out that last part for about a year when it was pretty scary. I mean, mm -hmm. my father was leaving the stove on, my mother was falling, mm -hmm. she got lost in the building, mm -hmm. you know. And I didn't live in Brooklyn anymore. I was up in Connecticut, and we didn't have any more family down there, mm -hmm. so I felt like, you know, all of the options here are terrible ones, yeah. you know. And so the least bad one was moving them up to an assisted living place near me. But this, but this raises again something everybody is familiar with: the, the guilt in that, oh, yeah. the decisions in that, yeah. and that comes through in your story as well. I mean, the the, the toll yeah. on they didn't your psyche, yeah. which I mean, those of us who followed you for years know is already beginning is a sort of a anxious one. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, I just think it's a reality. I mm -hmm. mean, there was the options were either like I had to deal with it, or I just completely turned my back on it, uh -huh. and that did not really seem like an option. There was nobody to pass it on to. Probably, if I had had somebody to pass it on to, you know, I might have done so, but I didn't. So where did where did this all leave you? Was it, um, I mean, I, I mean, the writing of it? Is it was it was that cathartic? Was that uh, did it do anything for you or? Um, you know, I, I, it's not cathartic. I didn't write it for catharsis, um, and it wasn't particularly cathartic. I think for me, um, I wrote it the, for reasons that I think I draw and write, which is that I, I have this sort of compulsion to keep track of things that happen so I don't completely forget them. And I think uh, I think especially with my parents, I wanted to remember who they were. You know, I wanted to remember all of it. I didn't want to purge myself of it. I wanted to remember it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to remember what they sounded like and weird stuff, like, you know, how they stood, their posture, the mm -hmm. kinds of conversations they would have. I didn't want it to all become, you know, like all the edges sanded off and then it's just this kind of like, Oh yes, they got old, and now I can't really remember what an, anything right. about that time. You know, so I, I feel like I did write down and, and keep track of all of it. All right, it's all in the book. Can't we talk about something more pleasant, Roz Chast? It's a real pleasure to talk to you. You too. Thank you. <laughs>